Arizona desert. Temperatures here can reach 50 degrees Celsius. There aren't many tougher places to work on planet Earth. But beneath the hard, dry ground lies incredible wealth. This is the Ray Mine. At 10,000 acres, it's one of the largest open pit copper mines in the world. Hey! Come on, let's go! Billy Skaggs is one of 800 mine workers waging a daily battle against the elements to dig copper from this unforgiving landscape. People look out here and all they see is a desert. For me, look at these mountains. I see money. The mine is the only major employer in the area. If the mine wasn't here, the communities would, would drop like flies. The mine's riches are hard to reach. The chalco pyrite buried in the ground is 35% copper, but it's widely scattered in the dirt, and the resulting ore is only 0.5% pure. To produce enough pure copper to stay in business, they have to dig hundreds of thousands of tons of rock every day. Anything that stops or even slows production threatens the mine's survival. Every time a truck's parked, you're losing money. At Ray Mine, they've got plenty of problems to deal with. The mine's three P&H 4100 mechanized shovels can lift more than 100 tons of ore in a single scoop. But keeping them running is a mechanic's nightmare. And when a glitch takes one of these big boys down, there's only one machine with the raw power to dig the ray mine out of trouble. The Latourno 2350 loader. Weight 258 tons. Bucket 40 cubic meters. Wheels four meters, the biggest on the planet. Driver Eric Duarte. Here I am as an adult operating the biggest loader in the world. I mean, what kid doesn't dream of that? The 2350 is the world's largest wheeled loader. Its superb all-terrain mobility enables it to race to any trouble spot, filling the world's largest haul trucks to keep the mine moving. And it'll keep on digging till mechanics can get the mechanized shovels back up and running. The L2350 loader is awesome. When a crisis hits, Eric and the loader keep the mine out of trouble. Six thirty a.m. Mine manager Steve Winkleman gathers his team. Seven still down. Twenty one still down. The searing Arizona summer heat is causing problems for man and machine. Yesterday we had a uh, incident on heat exhaustion. As hot as it's getting right now. Tough conditions are hitting production hard. But the bottom line doesn't shift because of the weather. The mine has to deliver. To stay in the black, the mine depends on the mine crew to shift a daily target of a quarter of a million tons of rock. To work in this environment, if you don't like pressure, you won't survive. The 1,250-ton P&H 4100 shovels can shift over 10,000 tons of ore every hour. But even these mechanical behemoths can't scrape ore straight from the bare rock face. Each monster needs a constant supply of loose copper ore to feed on. And 7 a.m. is feeding time. At the Ray Mine, the monster's meals are blasted loose from the rock face. Attention, please. The blast in the 1950 Mendel Creek will go off in three minutes. Work grinds to a halt while the rock is laced with explosive. Fire it all! In 0.3 seconds, 300,000 tons of hard rock is sent sky high. 
breakfast is served. With the hard rock face turned to rubble, Pat Rabb in his PH 4100 shovel eats into the mine's 250,000 ton target. I love playing in the dirt as a boy, and I still enjoy it. But playtime's over sooner than Pat wanted. I think we've got a bit of a problem here. Pat immediately downs tools and calls the maintenance crew. A dislodged boulder has cracked the shovel's arm. The mine's digging capacity is down 25%. We're going to get crews together and head that direction and see what we can do to get that machine back up. The welding team is called in to fix it, but they're not working fast enough for Billy. Hey! Come on, let's go! To get this operation moving again, he needs some serious digging power, and he needs it now. The Royal Marines, the elite of the elite. This hard-hitting fighting force is the tip of the spear for Britain's armed forces. Straight in when trouble breaks out anywhere on the globe. The job means they've got to be able to handle any terrain, any climate, any enemy. And they need a vehicle that can keep up. Viking. Since 2006, this warhorse has carried the fight to the Taliban in Afghanistan, bringing the elite troopers to the front line, and when things turn nasty, getting them out of there fast. Weight, 11 tons. Engine, 285 horsepower. Top speed, 65 kilometers per hour. Four Kevlar composite tracks can hurtle across almost any terrain. Snow, sliding sand, and even the steepest slopes are no obstacle. And when Viking runs out of land, this amphibious super transporter just keeps going. Viking, all terrain, all action hero. Crew, senior instructor, Sergeant Cy Culkin, 15 year Royal Marine veteran. The dependency on that bit of kit to get the uh, task complete is phenomenal. Instructor, Corporal Lloyd Fenner, a veteran of Afghanistan, known to his crewmates as crazy. This vehicle itself has saved my life countless times and colleagues alike. Imagine the heat of battle and the bullets are flying around and there is RPGs and things like that. The guys will tell you when this rocks up to pick them and take them away, it is an, it's an absolute lifesaver. Today, Sai and Crazy are preparing a bunch of new recruits heading for the battlefields of Afghanistan. The difference between success and failure in this training exercise could be the difference between life and death on the battlefield. The Royal Marines Armoured Support Group's role is to protect the commandos as they race to and from the front line. This vehicle will do what you need it to do when you need it to do it. At night, running up the estuaries, daytime, running over dodgy ground, perfect bit of kit. Does exactly what it says on the tin. The first challenge in any wartime mission is getting to the battlefield. Today's battlefield is 160 kilometers away. For the rookie crews, this is one tough driving test. The Vikings hit the road, and the 5.9 liter diesel engine starts eating up the distance. But these war horses are designed for the battlefield not the open road. And the tiny bulletproof windscreen massively restricts the driver's field of vision. So every vehicle has a crewman on top to be the driver's eyes. Hey, good day, mate. Their relationship is crucial. Keep it there. All right, start turning it right now. The rookie drivers pass their first test. And after four hours of hard driving, they're getting close to the battlefield. There's just one small problem, the River Tor. 72 kilometers long, ending in a 750 meter wide tidal estuary. The Tor has some of the fiercest tidal reaches in the country, with the water rising and falling up to six meters. 
The fierce river is a big challenge for the rookie pilots, but they've got to be able to handle obstacles like this if they're going to take the Vikings into combat. Corporal Smudge knows just how dangerous the river can be. You've got a big rip front that goes down there. We had one of these last year. Sweat, sweat down there. The Viking is amphibious, but it's no boat. The risk of sinking is real. And some of the pilots are showing signs of nerves. The Viking's tracks are covered in ridges 11 millimeters deep. On land, they provide grip over slippy ground. In water, they act like paddles pushing the Viking forward. But if conditions turn nasty, no amphibious transporter in the world can go up against the destructive power of wind and tide. If you get the tidal flow wrong, doesn't matter what that vehicle can or can't do, you're going against something that it can't beat. You'll get an ingress of water into the vehicle, the vehicle could sink. Before attempting the crossing, the rookie drivers take practice runs through the shallows to get a feel for how to handle their vehicles on the open waves. But the wind is getting stronger, and instructor Sai is getting worried. The speed is picking up, so it won't be long before it comes to a point where we have to say, no, you can't do it. Just a few minutes into the crossing, Sai throws the crews another curveball a simulated breakdown for the lead Viking. It's stranded, helpless, midstream. In battle, this sitting duck could easily be picked off by enemy fire. Sai would have to risk another Viking to make a dangerous rescue attempt. But in open sea, the smart move is to call for some heavyweight help. Help comes in the form of a landing craft. The seagoing vessel comes alongside, takes a line, and tows the stricken Viking to safety. With wind and tide just getting stronger by the minute, the amphibious crossing is called off. All they can do now is accept the help of the landing craft to cross the river and make it to their battleground in one piece. But even now, this river crossing is far from plain sailing. For the Viking driver, the landing craft is an awkward target as it drifts and bobs in the fast-flowing river. What will probably happen is there'll be something mechanical that goes wrong. And in the back of his Viking, he's got senior instructor Sai assessing his progress. On his final approach, the driver uses too much power and hits the loading ramp way too hard. Sai gets away with a few bruises, but in combat, the Viking's job is to transport Marines safely. The men, under Sai's instruction, have got to do better. Genschwalder, Germany. Genschwalder power station is working at maximum capacity. In the wake of Japan's Fukushima disaster, nuclear reactors all across Germany are being decommissioned. These wind farms are trying to take up the slack, but they can't provide nearly enough juice. Nuclear power provided 23% of the nation's energy, and now the Genschwalder generators need 80,000 cubic meters of brown coal every day to keep up with demand. A dedicated team of diggers works 24 hours a day ripping it out of the ground. But this vital source of power is buried beneath millions of tons of hard soil. Before the diggers can mine a cubic meter of coal, a hundred cubic meters of earth must be removed. This is earth excavation on a scale that defies the imagination. This 
is an excavator to match. The F-60, the world's largest moving machine. Purpose built for this job at the height of the Cold War by East Germany's communist regime. Weight, 30,000 tons. Crew, 25. Length, 600 meters. Crew, driver Ingo Herzog. Oh, man. Nach hier regnet und wieder alles voller Wasser hier. Foreman, Thomas Bukatz. Wie wir sehen, gibt es ein kleines Problem. 0530 hours and the day shift is ready for action. It's a bumpy drive in on the team bus, but no one in this job is expecting an easy ride. Foreman Thomas Bukatz is under huge pressure to uncover the massive brown coal reserves that power the city of Berlin and the surrounding area. To feed the Genschwalde power station its daily ration of 80,000 cubic meters of coal, his shift must first move a massive 150,000 cubic meters of earth. The business end of the F-60 is the three excavator arms, each scooping enough dirt to fill a swimming pool every minute. They dig relentlessly at one side of an enormous four kilometer long trench, uncovering the area due to be mined. Each arm feeds the earth it digs, known as overburden, back to the massive conveyor bridge. The 600 meter long conveyor bridge's network of rubber belts carries the overburden up 30 meters into the air before depositing it in four separate streams of dirt covering the ground already mined. An hour into the shift, the F-60 is making good progress when Ingo gets a call from one of the men on the ground. Up ahead, the coal extraction team has left a container near one of their diggers. Now it's stuck directly in the path of the oncoming excavator. The only option is to lift the excavator's mighty digging arm high enough to clear the obstacle. A jungle of steel cables lifts the giant excavator limb like a thousand ton steel puppet. But it's moving too slowly and the container is getting dangerously close. Excavator driver Robert Andorfer sends an engineer down. He needs eyes on the ground to give him inch-perfect guidance. Danke. It's the only chance he's got to clear the obstacle without having to stop the F-60 dead in its tracks. The electric winches that pull on the excavator armed cables aren't designed for this kind of stress. They scream in protest as Robert forces them to wrench the arm upwards. Slowly, the excavator arm rises. Gleiche passiert nachher auch mit dem 1300, der wird dann auch ausheben müssen und dann hier Thomas can only watch. If the arm can't clear the container, steel will smash into steel. At the last minute, Robert realizes he isn't getting the height he needs to clear it. And he swings the arm to the side instead, narrowly avoiding collision. 